Thousands of years ago, our hunter-gatherer ancestors encountered some slightly tamer than average wolves. These primitive humans fed their scraps of food to the wolves, who accepted the humans' hospitality, joined them on their hunting expeditions, and eventually kept them company in their homes. The descendants of those wolves, aka dogs, have become some of the most popular pets in the world, and other animals have followed suit. Ancient Egypt was famous for its cats, who helped kill pests that threatened food supplies. All in all, there are estimated to be about a billion pets worldwide, including dogs, cats, birds, fish, lizards, you name it, and someone, somewhere, probably has it for a pet. Nowadays, relatively few people rely on their pets to hunt or kill. And it's hoped you'll never need your pet to protect your life in battle, though I'm sure your corgi would totally rip out the throat of anyone who tried to hurt you. But the notion of the animal companion, a steadfast and loyal beast that fights at your side and performs other essential tasks, is still with us today and is a common element of role-playing games both digital and physical. There are several examples of pets in history taking on larger-than-life roles that resemble the loyal, and sometimes combat-ready, animal companions of games. Let's take a look at some of the goodest boys and girls from history, whose exploits might have helped shape how your ranger or druid's pet came to be portrayed. If you're like me, you probably thought Grizzly Adams was just a TV show from the 70s about a 19th century mountain man in the American West. It turns out the show was based on a real person, with the usual television embellishments of course, but the historical Grizzly Adams did resemble his TV counterpart in many ways, including the kinds of pets he kept. John Boyden Adams was born in the suburb of Boston, 1812. He practiced his craft in the rugged woodlands of northern New England before heading out west in the early 1850s. In 1853, he befriended a yearling grizzly cub that he named Lady Washington, who served as his pack animal and even sheltered in his cabin with him. A year later, he found a pair of two-week-old grizzly cubs, one of whom he named Benjamin Franklin, and it was this brave animal who served as the inspiration for his companion on the TV show. In 1855, the real Adams and Ben came across an angry mother grizzly. She savaged both of them, according to one source mangling Adam's face and ripping nearly his entire scalp off. Her claws tore a hole the size of a silver dollar in his skull, exposing his brain. It never healed. Ben heroically fought off the angry grizzly, suffering his own serious wounds, and the two managed to limp to safety. Adams trained many more animals, including an enormous grizzly bear he named Samson, and eventually returned to civilization, opening a museum slash zoo in San Francisco in 1856. In 1858, Ben sadly passed away, and Adams aggravated his old head wound in an accident with one of his animals, the cub of Lady Washington, in fact. His health failing, he moved back east and joined P.T. Barnum's show, but after just a few weeks, he suffered another re-injury to his head and passed away on October 25, 1860. As I said earlier, cats were revered in ancient Egypt. Several Egyptian deities, most notably the lion goddess Bastet, were depicted as having feline heads, and the remains of cats have been found in many tombs. Ramses II, also known as Ramses the Great, reigned over Egypt for over 60 years, and is most likely the pharaoh who clashed with Moses in the Book of Exodus. Most of his battles, though, were of the traditional variety, notably the Battle of Kadesh in 1274 BC, when the Egyptian Empire fought against the Hittite Empire. At one point, the Hittites broke through the Egyptian line and surrounded the camp of the pharaoh. According to the Egyptian account, which may be biased in favor of its great ruler, His Majesty slaughtered the foe of the wretched enemy. His Majesty was slaying among them, and His Majesty was casting them down in heaps of corpses before his horses, although His Majesty was alone, no other with him. Alone is probably an exaggeration, as other accounts list an elite guard accompanying the pharaoh, as you might expect, as well as his horse named Victory in Thebes, and, quote, a living lion, follower of his majesty, slayer of his enemy. Or in more traditional speech, slayer of foes. Imagine being one of those Hittite soldiers, bursting in on the enemy camp and thinking you're about to capture the pharaoh of Egypt, only to be confronted by an angry lion. I wonder what level Ramses had to be to get a pet like that. Slayer of foes probably accompanied Ramses on other campaigns, and it's not hard to imagine the great pharaoh seated atop his throne and accepting supplicants while his pet lion lounges nearby, reinforcing the king of humans' bond with the king of beasts, and also serving as a subtle reminder that you'd better not be wasting the pharaoh's precious time unless you want to be the lion's next meal. 
An animal companion doesn't always have to serve in battle to be notable or have an effect on history. In fact, one of the world's most famous composers may have been inspired by a rather unusual muse. On April 12, 1784, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart completed Piano Concerto No. 17. On May 27th, according to his notes, he strolled into a pet shop in Vienna and purchased a starling which was miraculously chirping a passable impression of part of the concerto, which had yet to be performed in public. Maybe. The first documented performance of the piece was on June 13th by one of Mozart's students, but there's some evidence to suggest that Mozart himself performed it with a female violinist on April 29th. So maybe Mozart whistled the concerto and the bird responded, or another theory holds that Mozart visited the shop earlier in the year and wrote concerto number 17 based on the Starling's bird song, coming back later to purchase the bird, maybe as a token of appreciation. In any case, the Starling was Mozart's steadfast companion for the next three years, and it was so dear to him that, when it died, Mozart staged an elaborate funeral for the bird, which included a poem that began, Here rests the bird called Starling, a foolish little darling. He was still in his prime when he ran out of time, and my sweet little friend came to a bitter end, creating a terrible smart deep in my heart. Mozart had been unable to attend his father's funeral, which was just a week earlier, so it's possible that he was channeling some of his grief into an over-the-top ceremony for his departed pet. Nevertheless, researchers say that Mozart's love for the bird was genuine. But did it inspire the great composer? Just eight days after the Starling's death, Mozart completed A Musical Joke, a satirical and intentionally error-prone piece meant as a parody of inept composers, and it's believed that its composition had much to do with his beloved bird. Is the piece a musical joke? Perhaps. Does it bear the vocal autograph of a starling? To our ears, yes. The illogical piecing together of uninspired material is keeping with the starling's intertwining of whistled tunes. The awkwardness could be due to the starling's tendencies to whistle off-key, or to fracture musical phrases at unexpected points. The presence of drawn-out, wandering phrases of uncertain structure also is characteristic of starling soliloquies. Finally, the abrupt end, as if the instruments had simply ceased to work, has a signature of Starlings written all over it. Given the propensities of the Starlings we studied and the character and habits of Mozart, it is hard to avoid the conclusion that some of the fragments of a musical joke originated in Mozart's interactions with the Starling during its three-year tenure. So the next time you create a bard character, maybe give him or her a songbird as a pet. It might not be any good in a fight, but a generous GM might at least give you a bonus to your performance roles. Finally, what list of animal companions would be complete without a magical familiar? Only in this case, its owner wasn't a wizard or a witch. Prince Rupert of the Rhine was the nephew of King Charles I of England, and when Charles was embroiled in the English Civil War in the 1640s, he called upon his nephew to lead the king's royalist cavalry against the parliamentarians who wanted to abolish the monarchy. Rupert's steadfast companion during the early stages of the war was a large white hunting poodle with the simple name of Boy. This faithful companion accompanied his master into battle on several occasions, and it was his ever-present nature that resulted in a number of fantastic tales springing up about him. As in any war, propaganda was rampant, and Rupert and his pet were frequent targets. Rupert himself was described by his enemies as brash and arrogant, probably true, and also accused of cowardice as well as atrocities such as burning the town of Birmingham to the ground. As for accusations against Boy, they were first made by the parliamentarians, Perhaps because Boy's survival through multiple battles gave them the idea that the dog was satanic and had unnatural survival and combat skills. In effect, they were attempting to smear their enemies by saying that they were in league with the devil. But the Royalists turned the tables by expanding the rumors and turning Boy into a truly terrifying foe, one that their enemies would fear in battle. Boy's supposed powers included the ability to catch bullets in his mouth, having fur-like armor that blades couldn't pierce, being able to turn invisible, find treasure, speak multiple languages and predict the future, and that he was, quote, some Lapland lady who by nature was once a handsome white woman. Two years after arriving in England in July 1644, Rupert faced the parliamentarians in the Battle of Marston Moor. He left Boy in camp, but the dog raced out during the battle to locate his master and was shot and killed. Rupert's forces lost the battle, routed by Oliver Cromwell, no less, who would go on to lead England after the parliamentarians won the war. And some would say that Rupert's side was defeated because of the loss of the army's mascot, 
or maybe magical familiar during the battle. Almost 400 years later, there's still some uncertainty as to how much of the propaganda about boys' powers were believed to be genuine, and how much was meant to be a hyperbolic exaggeration of the parliamentarians' initial belief in boys' satanic nature. One thing's for sure, though. This dog has had books written about him and has a Wikipedia page, both of which are feats you and I will probably never manage. Maybe I should find someone to write about my magical powers. Thank you so much for watching this video, and I hope you've got some ideas for your pet or animal companion in your next game. As ever, feel free to like and subscribe, and leave a comment letting me know what you thought of this video, or what you'd like me to cover next. See you next time!